Let's make sure it's recording okay. It is. Okay, center limit theorem. Let's fire it up. Okay. And it might be you guys, what I've noticed is you guys tend to ask for different ones than they do anyway. So it might just continue that, that trend today. But I wanted to let it know because of this being a review day, it might be nice to have more options. All right, mighty simple limit theorem. Here she is. Just a fire, my friend. Uh, Which one are you looking at, my friend? 11 on the actual... Oh, it's in the book. I'm going to stop looking for it then. Okay. <laughs> so let me let me actually do this. Sorry. I was assuming it was any question. Let me write down some stuff you've got up there, okay? So we just heard... Let me put this down, too, so we get the board. So a certain population has a mean of... Give me that again, Chessa. Uh, the mean... Standard deviation is 30. Okay, love it. The sample of size is 36. CLT. Okay, so from the book, Central Limit Theorem, question number 11. It has an average of 500, a standard deviation of 30, and we're drawing a sample of size 36. That's what I'm hearing. Okay, love it. Love it. Go. Uh, what value would you expect to find for the mean of all these samples? Good. So, we're essentially repeating what we did in class with the dice, but we have no dice. In other words, we have this. Now remember, this is fictitious. You're never going to know this, correct? You're never going to know these two values. Why? What average is it? Yes, it's the average of the population. The only way to know the average of a population is to measure the entire population, which is impossible. Of course, the average has a population. It's just that you can't get it. That, that's the problem, right? Good, so this is out there and that's out there and you can't get either one directly, so you draw your sample. sample. You sample, and your sample's gonna have an average. Your sample's gonna have an average. I wanna answer two questions. I wanna answer the book question, but before we answer the book's question, I wanna answer my question first. What is the average of the sample you draw going to be approximately? It's gonna be about the same as the population, isn't it? It's going to be about the same as the population. Now, I put approximately equals, and we haven't really defined about yet, but i got a feeling that somewhere in this question we're going to deal with the about. Are there more, is there more than one part to this question, Chessa? Yeah. Okay, so part A is, this isn't the question that was asked. She asked, what is the average of all of the sample averages? So in other words, if you took every single possible sample of size 36 and made a curve of those, first of all, what shape is that curve going to have? What's it? Be brave. Be brave. If you took a bunch of samples of size 36, just like you guys did yesterday with size 4, and you graph all those samples averages on a, on a horizontal axis, what shape is it going? It's going to be bell-shaped. Okay. That was why I got so excited on Monday. Well, for among other reasons. I mean, it's math class. But <laughs> you get bell curves. They show up. I mean, as soon as you start sampling, you get bells. So it's going to be bell. And where is the center of that bell going to be? In the middle. In the middle, well, in the middle, right? But what, what would numerical value? <laughs> Zero. Well, careful on this particular data set. It's going to be the average. It's going to be a 500. Yeah. So I made up the symbol that x double bar was exactly equal to 500. That's the question the book technically asked. If you average all of the averages, what will it be? And it is exactly equal to 500. But your sample average, it should be close to it. Should be close to it. Does that make sense? So essentially, the big takeaway: when you draw a sample from a population, assuming you drew it randomly. Your sample's average should mirror the population average. Yay. That's good, right? That's good. All right, Chesna, part B. Uh, what value would you expect to find for the standard deviation of all these samples? Boom! Otherwise known as the, remember that, that clever little term? Standard, remember the, remember the phrase SE or the initials? Standard, standard, standard error. error. Standard error. Say that again, Athena? I didn't hear the question. Oh, the, the question was what value would you expect the standard deviation of that distribution of averages to have? And it's called the standard error or the standard error of the mean. So but technically, this is the, 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 the trade name is standard error. Okay? Would it be the same as the population of 36? Would it be the same as the population of 36? What do you think? Because the average was the average of the samples is the same as the average of the population. Is the is the deviation of the average just the same as the Population's deviation. I hear a very confident vote for no from Sarah. She is correct. Because what happens as you start sampling? What happens to the deviation of those averages? It goes up, right? Okay. 
you can disagree with me, because it doesn't go up. It goes, it shrinks, it goes down, remember? It gets smaller, remember? Our original spread out, spread out distributions of dice, and you started sampling, and I think, it, Sarah, I think it was you, you noticed the outliers started disappearing. Somebody noticed in this class the outliers started disappearing from the samples because it gets harder and harder to get the outliers, especially multiple outliers. So the distributions start losing the ends and start collapsing towards the average in the middle. But by definition, that means there's less variation, right? If it goes from this wide to this wide, there's less variation, right? Kind of make sense? So that's cool. It goes down, but the book asks us, what's the actual value of it, right? What is the value? Well, I don't know. It's less than 36, but how much less? And this is where, here's a formula I'll put on the board for you if you need it. Standard error is defined to be the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. I'm sure you've forgotten that between Monday and today. I'm sure you have. Because it's one of those things that doesn't roll off the tongue, number one. And number two, you learned it, you totally had it in class on Monday, and you probably had like chem in some kind of CrossFit class, or who knows, like Spanish. Lots of other stuff that flushes that out of RAM. Yes, ma'am. I, I said it's less than 36. I meant less than 30, what I was saying earlier. Yes, it's less than 30. This tells us how much less than 30. 30 divided by the square root of 36, that's uh, 6, right? 30 divided by 5, 6, is 5. <laughs> Check the math up here. So that's going to be your standard error. In other words, friends, in other words, your distribution, this distribution of sample averages right here, if you were to graph this, I can actually draw a picture of what it's going to look like. I can draw a picture of what it's going to look like. Can, and you can too. We can draw a picture. I don't know what the original population looks like. I have no idea. It didn't tell me anything about it. It didn't say it was binomial, or it was bell-shaped, or it was bimodal. I have no idea what the original population looks like. But I know I can draw a picture of the distribution of averages. You're going to help me do it. You're going to help me do it. It's a bell curve. It's a bell curve. What number's in the middle? Zero. Careful. Oh. <laughs> right, it's that. That number's in the middle. Yeah, I got you guys trained too. I've got you guys trained too well. You got it. It goes to zero when you start actually getting the probabilities, these scores, exactly. But these are, we're grabbing X bars. So in other words, we're taking a sample of 36, finding the average, then taking another sample of size 36, finding the average, and we're grabbing all those averages. So you're going to have 500 in the middle. 500 in the middle. Okay, we know that. How about that standard error of five? Now remember, standard error and standard deviation, they imply the same thing. So, and you add and subtract it from the average, you pick up certain percentages. So, if I go five up and down, how much area have I now trapped? There you go. If I go up here to 505 and down here to 495, I have now trapped 68% of my data between those two values. Why? Well, yes, I do want to, but just because I want it doesn't mean I can get it. How can I get it? it, it it's, a, it's an obvious answer. Because it's one standard deviation of a bell curve. One standard deviation of a bell curve traps two, it's the same reason you guys said two thirds or 68%. Is because that's one standard deviation of a bell curve. Let's pop out, let's pop out one more, okay? So if I go up to 510 and go down to 490, what have I now trapped? Two standards, 95. Five more on up and down, we'll go up to like almost 100, not quite, 99.7, I think. So it behaves as a bell curve. But the key is, you're graphing the averages here, not the population itself. The population itself has a very, very wide standard deviation. But you're not graphing the population. You're graphing the averages drawn from that population. And the, the higher the number you draw, the tighter that bell curve comes in. So for example, I'm gonna draw a couple other curves. I, I'm sorry, Chessa, I'm over answering this question, but I think this is important stuff to kind of hit at. If I drew samples of size, say, five or 10, the sampling curve would look more like this. Wouldn't it? If I drew smaller samples, it's gonna be shorter and wider. Yeah. Because as I draw more samples, it gets taller and skinnier. Mm -hmm. so, if I, so this would be like, this would be, I'm gonna put N less than 36, if that's okay with you guys, you might just call it like that, N less than 36. If I draw N more than 36, anybody wanna draw that curve on with green up in here? Green? Yes, I'm afraid. 
Corey, Corey, you want a beer? Want a beer? Yeah. 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 Me, YouTube sure. star. Yep. More than 36. More than 36. Higher it gets, the steeper it gets. I love it! Look at that! Go ahead and put a little arrow in put and it's greater than 36 on there if you don't mind. Thank you! Love it! Love it! Excellent! Thank you, my friend. So basically, it's, it's a slider. As N goes up, the, the curve goes up, it brings in, and as N goes down, basically, essentially. Cool! That's all we're after. So that's why some of you, I could tell some of you were like, wait a minute, how could the population standard deviation be 30? and the standard error only be five. Because you're technically erroring two different things. The sigma is the absolute average distance between every data point in the population and 500. So that's all, that's all kinds of spread out. But when you start sampling from that population, those end pieces, the tail outliers, start to fall off. And you're not going out to them anymore because the averages aren't getting out to them. Or they're getting out there very rarely, so they're not really counting in the overall computation. Is that, is that fair-ish, believable-ish? If not, 244 will clear the rest of it up. Jessica, go. So 36 is not the actual amount of data points. It's the, it's the amount of data points in one sample that we're drawing, but that curve that I've drawn represents lots of samples of size 36. So for example, yesterday when you guys, say you rolled your dice 36 times and you got one sample average, you would then put your data point like right there. And let's say somebody else got an average and it was over here. And somebody else got an average and it was over here. And then somebody else got one that was close to yours and it's here. You just keep doing it. And remember Max in the Plinko game? Where he was dropping the balls at Omsi, he was dropping the balls into the curve and it tilted. That's what's going on here. Every one of those balls is one sample average drawn from an experiment. That's the curve those balls live on. Is, is that fair? Yeah. Good. Good for you, my friend. Was there a part C? Uh, what shape did we expect? Well, we got that, didn't we? No shape's good. Awesome. How about part D? That's it. Well, we, we over answered well then. Bell. Bing. I should bring God in the class. <laughs> Please. <laughs> That's okay. Um, how do you know just by looking at those numbers it's going to be a bell shape? That's a very, very good question, and we did not prove it in class. Okay. So it's not at all obvious as to why. That's part one of three of the central limit theorem. Okay. It guarantees a bell shaped distribution as soon as you start sampling. That's a bit of a cop out. If you want to see proof as to why, the you know, Richard Page's website has a link. Translate that in if you have trouble sleeping some night. <laughs> that should put you out in about 35 seconds. No, it, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it, it, it requires calculus, which is why I kind of let, some of the stuff I let go, but the bell, don't worry, the bells, the bells are guaranteed. Oh, yeah, you just flip the bell shape and call it good. And that's actually a question. I like those questions, like what shape will it be, bell? And don't be, if I put things like, it's drawn from this highly trimodally skewed population. What shape is the sampling distribution? Bell shaped. It's, just, it's always bell shaped. It doesn't matter what the original. That's why I said I have no idea what this distribution looks like. It could be. It could have five modes that are all over here and an outlier out of like eight thousand. But the sampling distribution is going to be bell shaped. Yeah, you got it. You got it. Good. It's the lame answer. But like I said, if you want to check the cat or go to sleep really quickly, just check out the. <laughs> Yeah? Good, Jessica, make sense? Excellent. Anything else? You guys call. We got the normal problems, we got the Bishop California Hotel problem. Can we look at that one? Can we go camp at Big Tree? No. Where's that? <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we camped in the milks. I think it was illegal. <laughs> and then we camped oh, at, is, no, big, is Big Springs that crazy like, like war zone looking place? Yeah. Then we have camp there. Oh, wait a minute, no, this is just, this is like the dirtbag climber campground where it's just, it's just a big, like, raised plot of land. Yeah, it's just like a lace, it, I think it used to be a dump site, they flattened it out, and they like climbed the there. What about in Long Valley out by the Green Church there, out <laughs> that mammoth? Yeah, sounds yeah. lovely, no, never can't there's, there's a bunch, there's a bunch of natural hot springs out oh, there, that like, the, all the locals, like, referred. Oh, sweet. So when you're going down 395 from Mammoth and... Pay attention, you two people, this is good stuff, good beta. We should all go there. You'll see a green church on the left. Green church. 95. Take green a left. Green church. Right there. <laughs> Go down that road. There's like 20 different hot springs. All, all these dirt roads out there. Right. Yeah. This YouTube is basically going to get spammed by the angry locals of Bishop California. <laughs> don't give away our campus, man. That's excellent. No, I've only camped in the dirt bag campground, and then we, we now stay in the hotel because Max doesn't 
chairs that came in the dirt bay. <laughs> but that's when I discovered the 68 inch tall shower head. We talked about this, right? Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Just FYI, I'm glad we did, because one of your take home questions is that question essentially. The, the, the designing flight seats oh, yeah, yeah. for Northwest Airlines, that's that problem essentially. It's exactly the same problem. It, I mean, basically, except it's seats and planes rather than Are shower heads. Are we talking how wide the average person tiny is? It's in there. 14.4 for guys. Plus or minus one. Plus or minus one. Plus or minus one inch. One inch. Wow. Fourteen inches wide. No, well, think about that. Plus or minus one's pretty. That's a that's a big that's a significant jump with only fourteen inches wide. One fourteenth is seven percent. So right. So you got two inches to get ninety five percent of guys. You're anywhere from a, a, a foot wide, twelve point four inches to sixteen point four. That's that's a lot of variation. It, it's hard to think about when you think about your pant sizes. I think I don't know about girls, but guys measure the the diameter. Like 32. I don't think girls size one, two, three. So eight, just like whatever. yeah. Some yeah. Do. Oh, some do. Right. So like you know, it, it's hard. But when you think about the width of a of a hip, it's a third roughly of the pants diameter. Because think about circulars, pi, so pi, in pi, or pi times the diameter gives you the circumference. You're roughly well, you're kind of like a. So can you answer me this question? Why can you put a pair of pants on your like when you close them up and you put them on your arm? Oh, I never heard that one. You can actually instead of trying them on, you can like have a close fist and you can. Once you button it up, it'll fit over from your elbow oh. to your arm, and it'll. You know this one, Tabitha? I got another one. Huh? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, seriously. Well, you you your to your your mm -hmm. That's the one I've heard. Yeah, yeah but apparently I've heard the neck one, but apparently the neck diameter is the same as the arm length. Huh? One of those human being yeah, averages that works really out. We did it 105 with the. We <laughs> measured. Okay. Remember, we measured 105. We did elbow to wrist and wrist to finger, really? and that's about the same proportion in every person, roughly ish. Um, but yeah, I guess that's another one I didn't know about. Yeah. Yeah. It's just one of those things. Like, it's just one of those measurements that kind of works out. Don't know why. No. Well, today's a free for all. It's in our DNA. But pretty much, yeah. Speaking of free for all, all right. what are we doing, Ben? Um, we'll actually page 116. If we could do number 38, I bet. Absolutely. And what, what, don't tell me what problem this is. Actually, ever, I'm going to put the problem on the board. This is great since it's not on my E problems. We, we, I want you guys to identify the type of problem by what Beth reads. Does that make sense? So if you don't have your book with you, that's actually a benefit right now. We're going to hear the problem from scratch with no like, oh, it's in the binomial section or blah, blah, blah. Let's just go straight from the problem and see if we can identify what kind of problem it is. Does that make sense? Okay. okay. Good, good. All right. So let's swing this over here. Give me the page again, Beth, if you would, just for reference. 116. Page 116. Good. In the book. Uh, what number? 38. 38. Fire away, my friend. Two or more defective, we're going to shut it down. Okay, and how many parts is so? I didn't catch the how many parts were selected. For random sample of ten parts produced by this machine, it contains two or more defective. So, here's here's the information I was given. We're going to so this machine makes parts. How many parts does this machine make? What do you think? Guess. Tens lots. That's what I want to chess up. Millions, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not lots. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on, hang on, hang on. No, 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 no. No, Tabitha, that's an excellent question. But we gotta, we gotta run the numbers first to show why that way we do this. Fair, fair enough. You're gonna be collecting two from a very large lot. Well, a lot of ten. A lot of ten. A lot. That's a sample. It's ten. But, no, no, Athena, I want you to hold that thought and connect tab with the thought in about five minutes. Because it's all, it's, it's a 244 question. It, honest, it honestly is a 244 question. It's what we're expecting and what we see. And, and we'll come back to it. Core p-value, we'll come back to it in a second. Okay, love this. So, we know there's a 0.5% defect rate. We're selecting 10, exactly 10. And if we get two or more defective, we're going to shut the machine down for recalibration. Love it. Okay. Love it. First of all, I don't want you to call this answer out, but I want us to figure out which of the three sections this comes from. Don't call it out. Let's think about it. Which of the three sections does this come from? Think about it. Think about it. Need a little bit of water. Are you trying to do this kind of stuff for a job, but we were a lot more lenient. Oh, I love that water. Yeah. People ingest those. Come from Delaware. Think about that. We're the worst water on the planet. You come here. 
That's extra protein. Think of it that way. Yeah. Or just do the We got some votes. We got some votes, Tabitha. Why? Tell me why. Because we need to find a, the Z score of when two or more would be detected. Now, I'm not saying you can't do it that way, but there's a much easier way to do it. Oh, okay. There's a much easier way. You can do it that way. Now, let me, let me give you a hint as to why it's not a normal problem. Well, the gen normal, but... Let, Beth, read the whole problem again for me, if you would. Sure. Of the parts produced by a particular machine, 0.5% are defective. A random sample of 10 parts produced by this machine contains two or more defective parts. The machine is shut down for repairs. Find the probability that the machine will be shut down for repairs based on the sample. Perfect. Now, you can do this with normal distribution. However, what words didn't I hear come out of Beth's mouth? Normally distributed. See, the only time, this is a good test taking strategy for next week, for next Wednesday, the only time you're going to have to bust the normal out to use it, or general normal, but that's not a program, you have to transfer it, yeah. is if you see the words normally distributed or the word normal in the problem somewhere. You can answer every problem on the exam using the bell curve distribution, but if, it's, if I'm not specifying that you create a bell curve distribution out of the data I give you, don't make, you, don't make life hellish by trying to use it. Is that fair? Yeah. So. It's not to normal, which means it's not in a normal distribution no more. The entire central limit theorem is based on normal distribution. Ergo, this is binomial. Ergo, this is binomial. Because that's where everything is left. It's not a normal distribution, which means it can't be central limit theorem either, because that's all about normal distribution. You see what I'm getting at there, friends? It basically has three sections you're picking from. If you read the words normal distribution, it's from that homework number eight, normal distribution. If you see the idea of a population has a blah, 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 and you see standard error, that's central limit theorem like what we just did. Now, this is by process of elimination figuring out this is binomial. Let's figure it out through direct comparison. Why is this a binomial distribution? Two outcomes, good, we'll come back to that. Two outcomes, either is defective or it is not defective. We've drawn a sample of fixed size 10. That was nice. You don't see samples of fixed size 10 in the normal distribution problems. Because there is no fixed sample, it's, it's forever left and right. Fair enough, fair enough. Some over here, Athena, go ahead. What were you gonna say? I thought I heard your voice. Was no, it you guys? Jess, Jess, I heard a female voice. I'm hearing you. You heard it, but I was saying the same thing. It was, oh, yeah, I did. Broken or fixed? Or Good, it's binomial, one or the other. One or the other happens. What kind of data is it? This is also kind of cool. 50, 50. It, it, well, it, it's 0. 0.5, 99.5. <laughs> so it's a coin. It's a coin, but what type of data? Remember, the data in this case is we're, we're seeing how many are faulty. <laughs> it's quantitative discrete. It's quantitative discrete. Which means this thing has a distribution, doesn't it? This, well, they all have distributions for the entire, all, all three sections, but this one has a discrete distribution, which is a t-table. This is the only one of the three that's a t-table distribution because it's countable. Remember, we're, we're sampling, as, as, as Kelsey said, we've got t a sample of size 10. And we're counting how many of those 10 are faulty, are defective, correct? Yes. We're counting how many of those 10 are defective. Ted, I've not forgotten about your question. It was fantastic. The theme is tied up. We're, we're, we're getting to it, I promise. We got to the rest of it first, though, to see why the question you asked is so good. So, two or more defective, we're going to shut down. Put that up here. Shut her down. Okay. So, I'm, if, you don't have to do this because your TI is going to actually make the distribution for us. But I'm going to write at least an, an idea of what the distribution your TI does is. So X, the left column where your data is, is the number of, let's put number of defective items in this column. How, how about that? Number of defects. And it's number of defects, as Kelsey pointed out, out of, out of 10. So this is like, you bought 10 birds at the ranch store. So it's 1 through 10, right? Zero through ten. Well, zero. Because it's possible, and that's important, yeah. right? It's impossible, and as a matter of fact, you would see why it's so important to have that Raphael. It's impossible to have a defective item if you haven't made anything. Well, that's true, but it, it, it is possible that all ten are good. In other words, zero are defective. As a matter of fact, that's the most likely outcome based on that average defect rate, right? If only one half of one percent of items are defective, we shouldn't have zero to be the most common because they should, they're mostly good for the most part. And then it goes 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way down through 10. 
Now, I'm writing this, this is a little bit excessive because your TI is going to do all this for you. It's like, is this okay? Yeah. okay. <laughs> your TI will do this for you in L1. But that's your data. Now, the probability column, I'm not going to write this up in this chart because this is where your TI's program disk fill comes in. Oh. Right. Remember him? It's been about a week and a half, two weeks, we play with this fill. It's been a week, and I know, I, that's why it's so quick. It's RAM. Our RAM tends to flush these things out pretty quickly. So that's why I like going back to problems. That's why I love this last day just being a big old catch-all day. So, so, we're buying chickens, 10 of them. We got some girls, we got some boys, maybe. The trick is to see how many girls, how many boys. So, we're gonna label defect as getting roosters, non-defect as getting hens. We're gonna turn the screen on, switch over to the dot cam, here we are. The, the, we're gonna do that in a second, you got it, my friend. Is that, yes, that's exactly correct. Okay, so we're going to start up this fill. Oops, I'm in the wrong.